Well, I want to go over a couple of more sections from Suzuki's introduction to the Lankavatara Sutra, the first section of which is called Unobtainability. This going beyond all forms of dualism, however differently it may be expressed, whether as being and non-being, or as oneness and manyness, or as this and that, or as causation and no causation, or as form and no form, or as assertion and negation, or as samsara and nirvana, or as ignorance and knowledge, or as work and no work, or as good and evil, or as purity and defilement, or as ego and non-ego, or as worldly and superworldly ad infinitum, this going beyond a world of oppositions and contrasts constitutes one of the most significant thoughts of the Mahayana. So again, this notion of non-dualism or non-dualistic thought, well, which of course is a contradiction in terms in itself because thought is by definition dualistic, so excuse me for that. But basically, uh, non-dualistic consciousness, let's put it that way is the base of all mystical traditions of all religions and certainly as Suzuki is saying is the essence of um, you know what how one can describe using a concept that consciousness and experience that transcends or goes beyond or behind ordinary mundane consciousness of everyday life so he says there is nothing real as long as we remain entangled in the sky of relativity and our sufferings will never come to an end. We must therefore endeavor to take hold of reality, but this reality is not something altogether solitary. For in this case, no one of us will be able to have even a glimpse of it, and if we had, it will turn into something standing in opposition to this world of relativity, which means the loss of solitariness. That is, the solitary now forms part of this world. Thus, according to Buddhist philosophy, reality must be grasped in this world and by this world, for it is that, quote, beyond which is also within. I'm thinking about Aldous Huxley and his great book on the perennial philosophy, and he starts the book with that, I believe, Hindu phrase, thou art that. In other words, Again, to, uh, you know, and excuse my previous language in terms of, uh, you know, words like transcendence. I mean, again, samsara is nirvana. Nirvana is samsara. Form is void. Void is form. Form is not different from void. F void is not different from form. So this very reality, this, you know, du dualism itself is non-dual, okay? If that makes any sense. And I think that's part of what he's saying. The beyond which is also within so it's not like there's something out there uh, that you know is separate from ourselves you know again we are an integral part of the universe interconnected when I even use the pronoun we or I I mean it's a it's a misnomer so any thoughts any words any ways of describing using language fall short and that's again a basic message of the Lanka is that you know, the truth cannot be expressed in words. The Lanka compares it to the moon in water or a flower in a mirror. It is within and yet outside. It is outside and yet within. This aspect of reality is described as unobtainable or unattainable. And just because it is unobtainable in a world of particulars, the latter, from the point of view of reality, is like a dream, a mirage, and so on. The subtlest relation of reality to the world is beyond description. It yields its secrets only to him who has actually realized it in himself by means of noble wisdom, or aryajana, or prajna. This realization is also a kind of knowledge, though different from what is generally known by this name. 
And then he gets into a section called epistemology, which I think is the study of the, the nature of knowledge. How do we know what we know? Without a theory of cognition, therefore, Mahayana philosophy becomes incomprehensible. The Lanka is quite explicit in assuming two forms of knowledge. The one for grasping the absolute or entering into the realm of mind only and the other for understanding existence in its dualistic aspect in which logic prevails and the vijnanas are active. The latter is designated discrimination or vaikalpa in the Lanka and the former transcendental wisdom or knowledge is referred to as prajna. To distinguish these two forms of knowledge is most essential in Buddhist philosophy. The Lanka is decidedly partial to the use of Aryajana instead of Prajna, although the latter has been in use since the early days of Buddhism. And Prajna certainly, in terms of, you know, my exposure to Mahayana Buddhism is the, the main term that, uh, that I've always used and thought about as the, you know, the sixth of the six paramitas or perfections that represent the Bodhisattva path. Prajna is wisdom, which is the um, insight into sunyata or emptiness or, again, suchness, if you want to look at the flip side. So going on. Arya jnana, or noble wisdom, is generally coupled with pratyatma, or inner self, showing that this noble supreme wisdom is a mental function, operating in the depths of our being. As it is concerned with the highest reality, or the ultimate truth of things, it is no superficial knowledge dealing with particular objects and their relations. It is an intuitive understanding, which, penetrating through the surface of existence, sees into that which is the reason of everything, logically and ontologically. The Lanka is never tired of impressing upon its readers the importance of this understanding in the attainment of spiritual freedom. For this understanding, is a fundamental intuition into the truth of mind only and constitutes the Buddhist enlightenment with which truly starts the religious life of a bodhisattva. A couple of qualifiers here. Uh, and again, a lot of the Mahayana sutras talk in terms of highest enlightenment, complete enlightenment, uh, attaining truth, and also it says here attainment of spiritual freedom but we have to also keep in mind that while these are guideposts and guidelines and uh, helpful ways of thinking to encourage the bodhisattvas uh, ultimately there is no attainment ultimately there is no path ultimately truth itself is not a concept that's the in some ways the uh, the true liberation this transcendental jnana is variously designated in the lanka it is an insight fixed upon the ultimate ground of existence it is innate in oneself imagelessness beyond all forms of tangibility beyond discrimination meaning direct empirical knowledge before analysis starts in any form whatever, which therefore is not at all expressible by means of words. The awakening of supreme knowledge, or Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, is the theme of the Prajnaparamita Sutras, but in the Lanka the weight of the discourse is placed upon the realization by means of Aryajnana, of ultimate reality which is mind only. So that gives the distinction there, and you know the idea that different sutras emphasize different aspects of Buddhist doctrine. And I was glad here that he makes this um, distinction between, you know, this Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi uh, of the Prajna Paramita Sutras, uh, as compared to this mind-only uh, philosophy and approach. I guess you could say that the the Prajna Paramita Sutras are more based on the Madhyamika. Uh, lineage of, uh, of philosophical explanation or rationale for uh, the fundamental truth, if you will, in Buddhism, 
uh, as compared with this mind-only Yogacara system. But they both complement each other, and they both kind of, um, as I think Corliss said in his book on Buddhism, um, you know, help fill gaps within each other in terms of uh, helping the individual to uh, get a, a whole picture of the truth, if you will. This psychological emphasis, so distinctive of the Laka, which is the notion that the Arya Jhana of ultimate reality is mind only, this psychological emphasis, so distinctive of the Lanka, makes this sutra occupy a unique position in Mahayana literature. The knowledge that stands contrasted to Prajna or Arya Jnana is Vaikalpa Buddhi, or simply Vaikalpa, which I have translated discrimination. So you've got discrimination, a focus on particulars, versus prajna or wisdom, or a non-dualistic non perspective, which again, that in itself is dualistic, so there's a step beyond that in terms of non-dualism itself potentially being construed in a way that's dualistic. It is relative knowledge working on the plane of dualism. It may be called the principle of dichotomy, whereby judgment is made possible. By us, existence is always divided into pairs of conception, thesis, and antithesis. That is, being and non-being, permanent and impermanent, nirvana and samsara, birth and death, creating and created, this and that, me and not me, ad infinitum. And it's this breaking down reality into this versus that, that on the one hand permits problem solving in the world, because, you know, we have to discriminate and we're designed to discriminate through our thinking mind. And it helps us again to solve all kinds of problems and become the uh, kind of creatures we are in terms of our dominance on this earth. Uh, but at another level, it blocks our uh, vision, our intuitive understanding, uh, you know, understanding not in an intellectual sense, but understanding in a, uh, a deeper self-realization of noble wisdom, as it would say in the Lankavatara Sutra, of this more non-dualistic perspective. The Lakshana, or form of existence, thus presented to us, is not its real nature. It is our own thought construction. But our buddhi, which seeks after pluralities, fails to understand this fact and makes us cling to appearances as reality. As the result, the world in which we now find ourselves living ceases to be what it is in itself, for it is one we have constructed according to our own ignorance and discrimination. And isn't this consistent with what modern physics is finding in terms of the fact that, you know, what our senses, our vijnana, are designed to pick up within the world uh, is one angle on the world. It's one way of seeing things, but that there's such a, a profoundly different way of seeing things when you get down to the quantum level or the, even the microscopic level, much less the quantum level. So reality escapes us. Truth slips off our grasp. False views accumulate. Wrong judgments go on, adding complexities upon complexities. The habit energy thus created takes complete hold on the alaya vijnana, and alaya, the absolute, is forever unable to extricate itself from these encumbrances. Eternal transmigration to no purpose must be our destiny. But of course, it's not our ultimate destiny, because enlightenment is a possibility. Of course, some traditions think that it's possible in this life. Others uh, look toward, you know, rebirth in a pure land. Uh, but within the Lanka, it's that revulsion or revolution or turning uh, about in the, the mental functions uh, that uh, can result in that intuitive understanding that is the perspective on non-dualism that the Lanka is pointing to.